Hi everyone, and welcome to Experimental Sonic Arts Lab, my very own YouTube channel where I talk about all things that cross the boundary between sonic and visual art. Today I'm going to talk about some of my own research which looks at making art from self-tracking cycling data. So without further ado, let's go. This video is about a collection of data-driven aesthetic explorations that investigate the concept of cycling as art practice, which is made possible through the use of self-tracking tools while journeying by bicycle into the landscape. The explorations draw upon the philosophy of the walking artists and the concept of the dematerialization of the art object as counterpoints to the use of quantified self data, which aims to visualize previously invisible aspects of our daily lives for the purposes of positive self monitoring. In doing so, they begin to draw attention aesthetically and philosophically to the way in which representations of our experiences, particularly of landscape, can be formed through the use of such technologies for generative art purposes. In the middle of the 20th century, the art world became preoccupied with the notion of the dematerialization of the art object, as Lippard described it. This emerged as part of conceptual art making and characterised the intention of artists to free themselves politically, economically and aesthetically from the tyranny of the art object and its associated gallery driven norms. Foregrounding the idea or the experience over the object that represented it, to move away from the more formal concerns of minimalist sculpture and painting at the time towards the production of ephemeral art objects such as events, happenings, recordings, photographs and other forms of documentation. This radical approach to art making decentralised the art object and while it may not have dematerialised it altogether, the focus on the ephemeral aimed to reveal the ideas and experiences behind art making rather than trying to be art in themselves. One such approach to come out of this conceptual shift in art practices was walking art, pioneered by Richard Long and Hamish Fulton. Very simply, the walking artists made art by, through and about walking. Walking was their art. They brought things back from walks, they photographed things on walks, they reported on walks, and they used the gallery space as a way to communicate about their experiences of walking, some of which took place in very exotic, remote wilderness, some in mundane urban environments. Long's early work was often characterised by using water walking protocols and maps on which he would draw lines and circles that would determine the shape of his walk. He would then act out the shape of the walk by enacting the rule of following the shape of the line on the map in the real world. At times this wasn't possible, as the terrain would prove impenetrable. For example, a cliff face, impossible to traverse. However, by and large, this became a common method for practising walking art. Over time, such protocols became more complex. For example, a walk of four hours and four circles, or old New Year walk, a walk of 80 miles in 24 hours, the last 12 hours of 1992 and the first 12 hours of 1993. Sometimes the artwork was the map itself. At other times, it was photographs taken during the trip or stone circles made on location or sometimes even just statement of facts about the walk itself rendered in large vinyl letters on a gallery wall. Generally though, these ephemeral entities were often gathered together in book form to provide a specific documented outcome and latterly back into gallery spaces. Deciding from the outset that a particular protocol should be adhered to is an interesting constraint to set upon making art. It is a very useful one that has its roots in programmatic art of Saul Lewitt and others from the 1960s. This approach is of course highly suited to digital technology which relies on programming, more of which I will discuss later. Hamish Fulton famously stated that an object cannot compete with an experience, foregrounding the esoteric primacy of the experience of the artist and free exoteric material produced as echoes of that experience the purpose of which essentially was to remind us about how deep and unfathomable our experiences can be and how impoverished our representations of them are. A photograph of a mountain, no matter how good it might be, is not the experience of being there, but a reduced and diminished representation of it. 
Putting technology and protocols at the heart of creative practice requires a certain amount of consideration and organisation before setting off to make any work. Rather like planning an expedition, one has to consider the pros and cons of the particular technologies involved, as well as how the rules of engagement will fit with their capabilities. This in turn has huge effect on the kind of outcomes that emerge from the process once it is put into practice. For the artworks I'm presenting here, the technology of the bicycle was a significant component of that process. Like any tool, the bicycle can be considered an extension of our senses and our body. Forward motion and sensory input are essential to cycling. One must physically pedal the bicycle to move and one must look where we are going to find our way and avoid obstacles. It is a tool that extends the range and speed of walking. Physical fitness is essential to achieving this range and speed, which is challenged at every turn by difficult terrain and changeable weather. There is also always the danger of falling off and injuring oneself quite badly. If the bicycle is one component of the protocol that makes cycling data art possible, then the other is digital technology, which enables the automatic capturing of data about the cycling experience. Using two smartphones has become my preferred mode of operation. iPhone 1 is used to keep track of route data. Running an application called CycleMeter allows me to track my GPS coordinates, speed, altitude, weather conditions, and with the help of additional sensors, heart rate, power output, and pedaling cadence. The aim is to capture as much data as possible while out in the field to be utilized later back in the studio. The second phone has two purposes. Sometimes it is strapped to my back to capture accelerometer data and provide six degrees of motion, gyroscopic forces, and acceleration in the XYZ planes. At other times, it is simply used as a camera. The initial concept for producing outputs based on cycling data came from considering the way in which training data is used by professional cyclists. Training for cycling and racing is an arduous activity that requires not only a great deal of effort, but a great deal of rigour and accountability in terms of sticking to a training plan. Having raced both road and mountain bikes as an amateur at national level, I have some experience of doing this. Recorded data is usually presented in graph format and allows the rider to compare a recent training session against previous sessions to see if there are improvements in speed, endurance, threshold heart rate levels, or peak power output. Amongst the Pro Tour riders, this level of information is crucial to their daily activities, and its use is ubiquitous. It is also a core plank of the quantified self-movement and various fitness tracking devices and apps. One key training session is the interval session. Usually, this is comprised of several very hard bursts of activity, followed by shorter rest and recovery periods that follow a sequence. For example, 10 minutes warm up, 8 times 3 minutes at 300 watts, with 2 minutes of recovery in between. 5 times 5 to 10 minutes cool down. Such a session as this has a very clear pattern of activity, and it is this pattern of activity that was a testing ground for the early visualizations of cycling data that I made. The image here shows uh, initial sketchbook ideas for visualising interval sessions. Processing is a well-established software platform initially developed by Casey Rees and Ben Fry for digital artists to use in terms of making visual art through programming. Its range and scope is vast and ever-growing thanks to its open source ethos and the number of developers that contribute libraries and extensions to its capabilities. For me, it is processing's capacity to draw together data from multiple streams, as well as its visual rendering that makes it an attractive and useful tool. When thinking about the cycling protocol for making art, one has to also to think about how processing fits into this process. It can't be an afterthought. Indeed, it was the revelation that processing could potentially be used to visualize my existing data that led to the idea of consciously making art through cycling in the first place. Initially, a proof of concept was mocked up in processing using random generated data to control the alpha channel of a predominantly red square. Random data was perfect for this task, as at this stage it was only concerned with ensuring each stripe could be differentiated from one another. The logic being that if it works for random data, it will work for real data. The first image shows what this initial outcome looked like. The use of random generated data was enough to give a sense of how discrete points of data could be rendered aesthetically in a sensible fashion. 
However, it was far too removed from the reality of cycling data. Cycling data tends to change in an incremental fashion. Altitude, heart rate and speed all rise and fall in a fairly regular way. Perlin data provided a much better fit for emulating the rise and fall within the experimental visual problem solving phase. The second image shows a much more even change in data visualisation. Once the initial visualisation problems had been ironed out and a stable form for the data had emerged, what remained was to test this out with real data. The third image shows the first outcome using real heart rate data. As can be seen, it looks very different. At this stage, the use of the alpha channel was abandoned and the code was rewritten so that incoming data would manipulate the intensity of the red channel itself. The number of rows and columns are determined by the size of the data sample and each stripe represents one minute of time. The resulting image shows the eight distinct interval periods of intense heart rate activity, coupled with periods of rest and warm-up and cool-down phases of an hour's training session. The final image shows the first fully-fledged colour-mixed outcomes of three streams of data from an hour-long ride around the block where I live. There is an initial dark section that has hints of blue showing very little altitude or heart rate data, but some speed. Then shades of mauve and pink begin to alternate across the image at various intensities. As this ride was relatively flat with some minor altitude gain, the green channel has very little effect on the image. It is essentially a visualisation of putting power through the pedals of a bike to gain speed over certain distance. The variations of the colour are the variations in effort. Red, mixing with speed, blue, over slightly undulating terrain, green. Having established a working prototype that was proven to work with software protocol for visualising cycling data, it became apparent that this process had the potential to be used to visualise any length of ride over any kind of terrain and in doing so the resultant visualisation should not only clearly represent that data but it should also begin to establish colour patterns for the kinds of experiences that cycling involves. For example, purples, mauves and pinks tend to show that part of the cycling experience where the rider is putting in significant effort to travel relatively fast over even ground. The more intense these colours, the more intense the activity. Similarly, areas that are strongly green-blue in colour show a rider is essentially travelling downhill at speed without putting much effort into pedalling. The more blue the colour, the faster the rider, and the more green, the higher up they are. Areas of strong yellow should highlight the highest altitudes and greatest speeds as the colours mix. Furthermore, areas intense in red-orange show where a rider has put the greatest effort into cycling uphill. The stronger the colour, the steeper the hill and the harder the work. If we compare this image with the next one, we can see that these two images represent the same rider and the same route, only 13 months apart. There are obvious similarities between the images. Similar groups of colours appear at similar points in each image, but they are subtly different. So while the terrain is the same, i.e. the green altitude profile of the colour mixing is unchanged, the speed and effort of the rider is subtly different. This may reveal a number of factors that underlie the differences in the image, for example, the fitness energy levels of the rider. Additionally, there are other external factors that have to be taken into account, most notably the weather. Cycling on a windy day is much harder than cycling on a calm day. Thus, images with more intense pinks and, and less blues would reflect the extra effort needed to cycle against the wind. Precipitation can also have a dramatic effect on speed and heart rate. Take this image, for example. It is again nearly the same route as the other two. The greatest significant difference between this image and the other two is that this ride took place in terrible winter conditions. During the first half of this ride, windy and rainy which made progress slow and effortful, accounting for the upsurge in strong pinks and mauves. However, during the second half, which is characterised by the increase in green, the rain turned to snow and actually made it impossible to continue cycling around the route. At one point, I had to take a diversion, dismount from my bike and push the bike downhill as it was so unsafe to ride any further. The increasing green to dark section shows this icy descent capturing the change in altitude, drop in heart rate and my lack of speed. Iconic representations of places, such as photographs, show what a place looks like and tend towards the objective end of representation. From them, 
a certain amount of information can be assumed about what it must have been like to be there. For example, the barren landscape, the strong light, the implied heat from the sun. These are exoteric outputs that describe experiences from the outside. By contrast, esoteric art comes from the subjective end of the representational spectrum. They try to express what things actually feel like rather than what they just look like. The question is, does digital data such as heart rate data, which is essentially an objective measure, get any closer describing experiences from the inside? Is it more esoteric? Arguably, it could be. While any mediated representation is never the direct experience following Fulton's aphorism, arguably, personal data, such as heart rate, is much closer to the real sensations of being. It is a view of the inside, and it follows that just as one can imply the sense of being in a landscape by looking at a picture of it, arguably, one can imply a sense of experience from looking at data derived from that experience. After all, heart rate data, along with galvanic skin response, is often used to establish emotional responses and stress levels in psychological studies, and both are key components of the lie detector test. In the work presented here too, it is the combination of data that is important. Being in the world is not easily disentangled into subjective versus objective experiences. Experiences are embedded in the world by bodies that are deeply intertwined in their surroundings, as Heidegger and other phenomenologists such as Merleau-Ponty have pointed out. In this context, heart rate data is related to speed and altitude to give a broader understanding of the relationship between body, bike and environment. The picture that is presented is one of the embodied and embedded experiences of cycling in the landscape. The all-consuming pain and stress of climbing a steep mountain on a bike is visible towards the red-orange end of the spectrum, while the calm and relief of an easier gradient is evident towards the green-blue. Anyone who has cycled at the limits of their physical ability would recognise these sensations, and while the representation may not capture the entirety of an interior experience, surely it is a little bit closer than a photograph. In terms of my future work, one area to consider is the role of time in the execution of the work. Up to now, the striped paintings take the duration of a ride and turn it into a spatial arrangement of data in the image. It should be quite possible to visualise the same data over time, and this in turn will have a significant impact on how outcomes are realised aesthetically. At the moment, the striped paintings exist in both digital and printed format, some emulating real paintings hanging on walls and galleries and offices. Moreover, physical body movement, although mentioned earlier, has not at this point been activated in the visualisations. Again, along with time, this will play a fundamental role in future iterations of data collection, and software protocols may emerge as some kind of animation or time-based installation. That's all for today. I hope you found this presentation interesting, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Be seeing you!